right. Well, I guess we got SummerSlam mm-hmm. 93 to talk about, right? We do. Kind of a shitty show. Uh, oh, still there? Uh, yeah, sure we lost. Yeah, she was very loud. Jesus. That was Holy without, smokes. That was without the air conditioner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, uh, SummerSlam 93 is like a good start and a good finish, but the middle part of this show. Holy Christ, I was jealous of Craig driving to Idaho in 90 degree weather. I wasn't. Yeah, I can't say that. I'm lying about that part. But. WWF SummerSlam 93. Lex Luger's bus arrives at the venue in Detroit. And, like, this is not news, obviously, in, in 2022. But, like, we watched all these Raws, and it really hit me just how terrible this whole bus idea was. He showed up and body slammed Yokozuna. And since then, we have seen him. He got one great promo for the contract signing in person. He has not been live in front of a crowd aside from that in the entire time since. He's been doing these goofy, sit-down, wacky, junior-high editing videos, promos, and he's been on a bus. Yeah, he's on a bus the whole time. Yeah, but you know what? When he showed up at this building for this crowd, they were into this guy. He was a big star oh, here. They were into everybody. He, well, the, yeah, but I mean, they, they really liked them some Lex Luger, as we'll... Uh, yeah. As we'll get to as we get going. We open with Ted DiBiase versus Razor Ramon. Razor wearing the pink sauce gear here in 1993. Uh, great beard matchup, by the way. Razor Ramon and Ted DiBiase. So they had basically a long TV match. Uh, a great what match? A great beard matchup. What does that mean? It means both men have great beards. Razor Ramon? Yeah. That's he not- did? Because it's not long and scraggly, it doesn't mean it's not a great beard. A lot of guys and can't Ted... grow a beard like Razor. Oh, okay. Well, all right. right. I mean, he had he had five o'clock shadow. I don't know if I'd call it a beard. I think a, a beard. I think a Braun Strowman or Admin Tony. I'm thinking a Razor. Yeah. A lot of guys can't grow stubble like Razor Ramon had here. Regardless, wow. they had a slightly longer than average TV match. DiBiase's offense was almost entirely choking. And uh, he's beating him up for a while, and Razor just hits the edge out of nowhere and wins. And it really was not much of a match, but the crowd was very much into Razor Remote. Yeah, they got about seven minutes, and I mean, it was two good workers having a professional. It's really funny when you watch this show compared to pay-per-views today. I mean, these are these are like, for some people, the glory years of WWF pay-per-views. And you know, obviously, we get into the Attitude Era, and those are the ones people really remember, but... Man, we're talking like seven-minute match here, nine-minute match for the Steiners, 11-minute match for Shawn Michaels and Mr. Perfect with a shitty finish, five minutes for IRS and the one two three kid six minutes for the Jerry Lawler-Bret uh, Hart match, uh, although that had about a 30-minute post Dude, yeah. <laughs> Eight, <laughs> Ludwig Borg and Marty Jannetty, five minutes. That had to be like, least 20. They, they spend all this time building up these matches on television, and then it's pay-per-view time, and... You know, you you show up after all this time, and they build these feuds, and you get to the building, it's like, we got five minutes, Ludwig. And then you go out there, and you do your nothing happen in five-minute match, and you're out of there. My God. So Heavenly Bodies and the Steiners was next, and uh, I forget how much This time was you... a good match. This is, I thought, the best match in the show. This is an, a very, very, very good tag match. The Steiners are, of course, all-time greats. The Heavenly Bodies, Lord knows they knew what they were doing. And uh, the Steiners are here wearing their maize and blue in Detroit, and the crowd is just adores them. And Scott Steiner in particular loves all this stuff. And the, the, the Steiners run wild. They're these guys all over the place. They whip Jimmy Del Rey into giving Dr. Tom the ass lance in the corner. And it's not Tony Storm, so no one died. But watching Dr. Tom sell this ass lance from his own partner was a, a, a joy, a joy to, to uh, behold. Eventually, the bodies cut them off, and they're a great heel tag team. All their double teams look great, and every time Scott uh, just hits a, like a punch or a knee or a kick or starts to go to the corner, the bodies always cut them off and immediately tag out. Always keep that two-on-one advantage. Do not fight fair. And Jimmy Del Rey in the middle of the heat hits a float over DDT like The Rock would go on to do later. And the second time he tries it, Scott has a big old suplex to make the hot tag. Big melee breaks out. The bodies hit the racket shot for a two count. Then the Steiners kick out of that. Then the bodies collide on a moonsault. And Scott gets the pin with a Frankensteiner. This match ruled. 
Yeah, these fucking heavenly bodies were such great old school southern style heels. Between them and Jerry Lawler, like that was the best stuff on the show, really, was the work, the heel work of the heavenly bodies and Jerry Lawler. This was the best match on the show if you're talking like athleticism and work and the whole shebang. But honest to God, outside of the horrible finish for the main event, I I remember when I was young, really liking Yokozuna and Lex Luger. And I watched it again here at 47. And I still really liked the pacing of that match. I thought Yokozuna was awesome in the match. I thought Luger did a good job as the babyface in peril. As we'll get to, it's an absolutely horrific finish. But, I mean, honestly, if I had to watch one of those matches again, I might choose the main event. Mm. But I, I do think that objectively... The Steiner Brothers and the Heavenly Bodies was probably the best match on the show. But I I, I like that main event, as we'll get to. And those Heavenly Bodies, my God. Steiners look great. Just a excellent 10-minute tag team match. Shawn Michaels versus Mr. Perfect. So we talked about this coming in, how our memories were it was not as good as you'd expect from Shawn Michaels and Mr. Perfect. And I think that's fair. Much like it was a bad match or anything. The finish sucked. No, actual- this was a good match. Yeah. But the issue is, you had Shawn Michaels yes. and Mr. Perfect. Okay? Yes. These two guys could, you know, I don't say anything too horrible, but like, they could both have, a, let's just say, a serious illness. They could both have a 104-degree fever, and they're going to have a good match together, even in that state. So, when I watch this match, yeah, it's a good match. But it's a good match in the sense that it's the worst possible match that they could have together, even yeah. though it was still good. That's probably fair. So, Sean, <laughs> this is going to be a very, very, very weird comparison, but hear me out. Uh, our old promoter, Tim Flowers, was a very, very good amateur wrestler. And one day, Mike Santiago, who was still wrestling with the Five until very recently, uh, he was new with the company, and he was also a very accomplished amateur. And one day, Tim wanted to test him. And so Tim took him down, and Tim kept feeding him different escapes, and Santiago kept fighting them and getting out. And then Tim would do a different takedown. Uh, and that's basically what happened here with Mr. Perfect and Shawn Michaels. Shawn kept finding a different way to get out from under out from under Mr. Perfect, and then Mr. Perfect found a different way to cut him right back off again immediately. So even though it was like a babyface being host boss, except it was Sean the heel trying like hell to find a flaw in Mr. Perfect's armor and failing until finally they were out on the floor and Diesel is there just all in black head to toe. He distracts Mr. Perfect and Sean has a super kick for the heat because it was not his finish yet. And he works over the back for a while and Perfect finally makes his comeback with the drop kicks and a backdrop. He hits the Perfect Plex, but Diesel pulls him out of the ring. He's standing there brawling with Diesel. This is not a disqualification. Then the ref gets bumped. Then Diesel posts Mr. Perfect, and Sean wins by count out. That was what a goddamn horrible fucking finish this was. That was dumb. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've used this before, but if they wrestled a hundred times, ninety-nine of them would be better than this match. This was like the worst possible match they could have together, but still. It was solid wrestling, and some of the stuff looked good, but, you know, Sean, Mr. Perfect, this was 1993, okay? And in 1991, Mr. Perfect had that SummerSlam match with Bret Hart, the famous SummerSlam match. That was better. And he had a very, very bad back injury, and that was the last time that we saw him for a long time. And if I recall correctly, he essentially retired for like a year or something like that. And then he eventually came back. But he was never the same again. So, you know, when we talk about Mr. Perfect, I mean, he was a good worker. But I would say by this point, I don't think that I could call him like a great worker. He wasn't great anymore for physical reasons. He was still like a smart worker and everything like that. But he couldn't do everything that he used to do. Shawn Michaels would get significantly better. And Shawn Michaels... Uh, at this point, and I think even he talked about this maybe in his book or whatever, but uh, it was a Raven deal. He was trying to bulk up, and he overshot his target. 
And it was around this time. Actually, I think he'd lost a little weight by this point, but pretty much the heaviest he had ever been. And, you know, he worked a, a style where he's much better off being lighter and leaner. And so I think really it was just if they'd had this match a year earlier or two years earlier, it probably would have been fantastic. This was a Sean that was not in his best shape for a lot of reasons, a Mr. Perfect that was past his prime, a shitty finish, and that's the story of the match. One, two, three, kid versus IRS. No, they used to do a lot more of in 1993. They don't do any more. Big back body drops. Yeah. Every match on the show is a big giant backdrop or a big giant flapjack or sometimes both at the same time, which is not a good idea. But So during this match, and uh, Kid makes his comeback, and IRS kicks out of the moonsault, and IRS kicks out of La Maha Straw Cradle. And then Erner Urban hits a big clothesline. He stops for a minute, and he pins him. I was like, it okay. was literally, they, they, they did a spot, Kid's making his comeback, and and IRS actually kind of did like that uh, the the clothesline they teach the women where you like jump and land on your knees mm. and kid goes down and he sort of sat there for a while and he slowly crawled over and he covered him and kid did kick out but he kicked out at three and a half and it was a pin and I just I watched this and I thought. You know, this is everything I see in 2022. You got an idea with a guy. He's the one, two, three kid. He's skinny. He's not like the normal guys that you push. You give him a big win because you're going to do an angle with the Razor Ramon. That's really, in some ways, more about the Razor Ramon Ted DiBiase feud than really Razor Ramon versus the kid. And then, like, you've had your fun, and now this fucking guy can't beat IRS. So they do a five minute match, and the kid gets clean with a fucking he gets pinned with a clothesline. So, you know, obviously, you know, he ended up having a great career and everything like that. But if I would have been watching this live and I were reporting on it here on the show, my review would be Vince has already given up on the kid because that is absolutely the way it came across here. Either that or for the third time since he showed up here a few months ago, I thought, Jesus Christ, did he suffer another concussion? I guess it's possible. But That's what I thought. Cause I didn't really see anything on the... Uh, it doesn't look like a terribly match. vicious clothesline. Well, but also that was that was his singles finish when he had singles matches. It was so that was his finish that he hit the kid with. It wasn't just a random move. I remember it was him. a shitty looking move, but that was his move. He was using a Samoan drop, but then I guess Tonka showed up and they took that away. I the guess. right off, the right off. Huh. Anyway, yeah. weird. Honestly, for what it was for a five-minute match with a weird finish, it was pretty good. Uh, but that's that. Bret Hart is supposed to face Jerry Lawler. This so this was very clever, okay? Because the advertised match was Bret and Jerry Lawler. But uh, the story was that Jerry Lawler, uh, Stu and Helen Hart were supposed to be at the building. And they weren't there. And so they interviewed Brett's brothers. It was Owen and uh, I think it was Bruce. Keith. Bruce, yeah, Bruce. Very clearly Bruce. Owen, yeah, Owen and Bruce. Not Keith. So Owen and Bruce are there. And they explain that Keith, uh, Stu can't be there because he was in the hospital. He needed a, a full knee replacement or something like that. And they blame Jerry Lawler. So Lawler then comes out on crutches. And this dude does. His promo, I think, was longer than most of the matches on this show. This He's whole just, segment was just never-ending. He goes on and on and on and on and on. And finally goes, I can't work, but I have a replacement. And it's Doink. So Doink comes down, and they ring the bell, and the match starts. And I thought, motherfucker, this is some bullshit false advertising here. Now, to cut to the chase, they end up doing the match, and Jerry Lawler runs in. He uses the crutch for the DQ. He's really not hurt. And this leads to the announcement that Jerry Lawler now needs to get in the ring and do the match. So at the end of the day, they actually gave you what you paid for. And on top of that, we got a Bret Hart versus Doink singles match. Now, neither of them were like tear the house down matches. But Brett and Doink was a perfectly fine match. They're good workers. It was more of a story match than anything else, but it certainly wasn't bad. And, man, Jerry Lawler and Bret Hart were Jerry Lawler's using the broken crutch 
to to constantly be cheating behind the referee's back, and the fans are fucking furious, and he's hiding from the referee, and every time he gets that, they're like screaming at the referee to see this guy using the crutch. I was like, you know what? It's not it's not five star pro wrestling action. But goddamn, this is some fucking pro wrestling right here with yeah. two pros. So I overall liked the two matches. I wouldn't say that you need to like go out of your way to watch them, but I certainly was not irritated by by both of them. I thought they were both, for what they were, good matches. I thought I'm pretty sure, like honestly, legit, not exaggerate. I think Brett was on my TV for an hour. By the time this is all done, uh, he came out and did his entrance. Lawler comes out and does his promo, which is, you know, his promo went forever. He hates the whole Hart family. He's in Detroit. They make crappy cars. He was in a wreck. He hurt his knee. Eventually, Doink comes out. Doink has two buckets. One is full of confetti to throw on the fans. The other is full of water to throw on Bruce and Owen. And Lord knows you never need to give Bruce an excuse to get camera time. I think he was out there more than Doink was. So, Brett and Doink was fine. Honestly, if they had just built up Brett versus Doink, and he, who was a better wrestler match, it would have been better than this. Uh, I, I, I mean, we talk about how great Doink is every week on Raw, and I, I felt about this the same way Shawn Michaels. I felt about Shawn Michaels and Mr. Perfect. It was good, but if they wrestle ten times, it'd be better ten times. And uh, Brett finally puts him in the sharpshooter, and Lawler gets in the ring, and he waffles Bret Hart with a crutch, and that looked incredibly painful. So that was like a long TV match, and then there's a the whole post match thing where Bruce and Owen are trying to make the save, and Lawler keeps hitting with the crust. This goes on for a while. Lawler starts to leave with Doink, and then Tunney comes out and says Lawler has to wrestle or he's banned for life. And they, I think they said he would be suspended for a month. I thought life. It doesn't matter. He wrestled, so he avoided the consequences. So it's an hour of uh, well, it's actually just. It felt like an hour. It's 20 minutes of Brett saying, hey, look over there, and then hitting him with a crutch or choking him with a crutch over and over and over again. Finally, Brett makes his comeback. He pulls the straps down against Jerry Lawler, which I thought was a nice subtle touch that nobody noticed. Oh, it was a lifetime ban. You're right. It was lifetime. Yeah. And uh, it was also funny how in this whole segment, Bobby Heenan kept saying Jerry Lawler was the king before Brett and had been the king in wrestling for years, but they never mentioned where or why. A little like watching, like, uh, when you watch AEW, they talk about guys who were friends for years, but it wasn't on AEW TV. They don't make, tell you where or when it was. So, anyway. Uh, eventually, Brett gets a sharpshooter on Lawler. Lawler taps out, but then Brett won't, won't let go. This goes on forever. Even Dude, this segment right here. Even uh, Bobby Heenan is like, there's 20 guys in that ring. Use physical force. Yes. they First, he, he won't let go of the sharpshooter, and, like, a, another ref hits the ring. Then another ref. Then they start sending out all the geeks. And, and yes, there are literally, there's 20 guys in the ring. Jerry Lawler is, is he's like in agony. Screaming. Bret Hart is, is killing this guy with this move. Bobby Heenan is apoplectic on commentary, noting there's 20 fucking guys. Why are you patting the guy on the back? Fucking grab him and physically pull him off this guy. There's 20 of you, and of course 20 guys can't pull him off. And so so I'm watching this, and... I don't want to nitpick because Brett put like a lot of thought into stuff and he wanted it to be logical. Because when you think about it, and I'm watching, I'm like, they're going to reverse the decision. There's 20 guys in there. This guy won't break the hold. He's going to end up disqualified. They're going to give the win to Jerry Lawler. And then you think about, well, okay, think about what Jerry Lawler did to his father, okay? If if Jerry Lawler put my father in the hospital and he needed a reconstructive knee surgery, then yeah, I'm not going to go to that fucking hold. I'll hold him there till you know the next ice age. So, but then when the referees finally talk him into letting go and they announce the decision is reversed, now Brett's mad. And I thought this would have been so much better if Brett would have just been like, I don't give a fuck. This guy hurt my dad. I had to keep get that. But instead, he's angry about it. Which then makes me think, well, you're the geek that wouldn't let go of the hold. Like, you had to know when 20 refs are in there, if you don't let go of the hold, you're going to be DQ'd. Now you're mad about it? So I, I realize I'm probably overanalyzing this, but Brett usually is so good about having things make sense that him not letting go of the hold because he was so mad about what happened to his father, but then being angry when he was punished for it, that didn't make sense to me. So, whatever. I like the segment as a whole, but it did go on too long. 
So I thought Brett and Doink was fine if disappointing. Brett and Lawler did nothing for me. And it went a long time. And then Ludwig Borga versus Marty Jannetty. God help me. Holy, Holy smokes. S- ah. Do you, you realize, Vinny, we've mentioned many times that Ludwig Borga is the man who ends the undefeated streak of Tatanka? Yes. Okay. Did I, okay. They, they actually were already building that up. I can't remember when it takes place. I could look it up. But they're already building that up in this match because Bobby Heenan is talking about how Ludwig Borg is undefeated. And Vince is furious. He goes, the Native American Tatanka has been undefeated for nine months or whatever the amount of time is. Ludwig Borg has only been here two months. This is not even a fair comparison. And I'm thinking, my God, this guy had this planned all the way fucking back then that this guy was going to end the undefeated streak of Tatanka. And this Borga, is, he's useless in the ring. He can't do anything. He is just lumbering. He's slow. Fucking, you can't have a good match with Marty Jannetty. Like, how does Vince not see this? He's big. There were a lot of big guys. Yeah, there were a lot of big guys. He sucked. He was big and terrible, hideously boring, clubbers him, squeezes him, catches him on a dive, slams him, finishes him with the torture rack of all things. And at, yeah. the time, at the time, I was like, wow, that's crazy. That's Lex's old move. I don't know if you even watched this, but Lex, the, the main event happens. There's a Lex video package, and afterwards, as Lex is being congratulated in the locker room for his non-championship win, Ludwig Borga confronts him. Yes. They were doing, this was their plan. They were going to do Ludwig Borga versus Lex Luger until Lex got his rematch. Yes. So, yeah, God Ludwig tapped out Janae with a torture rack. Sucked. And then Undertaker versus Giant Gonzalez. This was much worse than the WrestleMania match, and that one sucked. I think my favorite part here, and favorite is doing a lot of work in that sentence, but... Uh, Taker, or excuse me, uh, Gonzalez goes to hit Undertaker in the back with a chair, but the chair is turned the wrong way, so the edges of the chair catch Taker in the back. I bet that sucked. And it's all giant Gonzalez. He can't sell. He can't hit a guy. He can't clobber. He can't nothing. Nothing. Nothing he can do. Paul Bear shows up, brings the wreath down the ringside. He drops Harvey Whipman. He gets the urn back. Holds the urn up. Taker is a superhero now. Does his comeback. 18 horrible strikes. And it's not Taker's fault. But eventually, Giant goes down to one knee. So Taker goes up top. Hits a top rope clothesline and wins. This sucked in every way. Bro, this was fucking atrocious. And it was one week ago on this show that I was talking about Giants. And here we are on the same show, a half hour apart. We have Giant Gonzalez. And then we have Yokozuna. And granted, Yokozuna was like 100 times the worker of Giant Gonzalez. But man, it was everything I talked about a week ago, watching it in action. This dude is tall, but he's just tall. And he's slow, and he's lumbering, and he's wearing that fucking stupid outfit. And not for a second does he come off as an actual legitimate physical threat. No. And then you watch Yokozuna in there. And because of his weight, because of his size, because of his ability to use his size and his his ability to crush his opponent, I mean, he came off as a fucking badass on this show. He was beating the shit out of Lex Luger. This was two guys playing pro wrestling, and it wasn't good. And thank God that match is over, and I never have to watch it again. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Atrocious. Random trios match. Smoking Guns and Tatanka versus Head Shakers and Bam Bam Bigelow. I don't know why this happened, but it was among the better matches of the show, uh, which I realized I was low praise, but I enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Anyway, the early part of it, they worked at like a lot of uh, trios matches in Lucha Libre, where it's less a trios match and more three different one-on-one matches going on at the same time. Because Bam Bam and Tatanka start, and they go at it. And then Billy Gunn gets in there with Fat 2, and they go at it. And then Samu gets in there with Barton, and they go at it. And eventually, Tatanka gets the hot tag. He goes in the warpath, and Bam Bam just kills him. Just wipes him out. I don't care about your dancing, he says. And he just runs him down. 
the guns come out without a, ta- without a tag. They get killed, and so it's it, it's t- talking triple team for a while. And they do the they lose a spot. They whip him to the corner and then whip each other into him. Take him out with a big triple headbutt. But they go up to the top rope. Three top ropes, in fact. And they go for a triple diving headbutt. But all three miss. At that point, I shit you not, people are jumping up and down. They are so excited that Tatanka may make a comeback. And in fact, Tatanka then pins Samu with a cradle. I cannot believe how much time this match got. I cannot believe how much heat there was. But aside from the Steiners, this may have been the second best match in the show. Up to the, up to this yeah. point, up to this point. I mean, it was uh, it was a pretty by the numbers tag team match, but the last few minutes was actually very good. And the triple flying headbutt spot where they all missed. I mean, they do a lot more near falls and kickouts and that sort of thing today. But I still, to this day, love the style where you set up for one big spot. And you build it up great, and all they had to do was a triple headbutt where they all missed, and that fucking crowd, they lost their shit at that spot. And then they went right to the finish, and it was over. So, good six-man tag. We interview Lex Luger's bus driver. It goes about as well as you would expect of a bus driver interview. And it's Lex Luger versus Yokozuna. There is tons of pre-match hype, and both national anthems, and Savage is out there waving the flag, and of course they have the Japanese flag, and uh, Aaron Neville is there to sing as the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, Aaron Neville. Yeah. He's a big star at the time. So, it's funny to watch this in one some ways, because Vince, of course, is... He, he, he can't find a number big enough for Yokozuna's weight. I swear to God, I'm not joking. The match starts, and Yoko, Vince says, weighs 470 pounds, 20 minutes later, Yoko has gained 130 pounds. He's a 600-pounder now. <laughs> well, at first, you know, he goes, uh, Lex Luger has dropped some weight for this match because he knows yeah. that uh, he will need speed. He's, he's 260 pounds. And he goes, maybe 270. Uh, and uh, then when was they the last tried- time Vince talked about how small a main eventer was? Uh, well, then he tries to talk about the size of Yokozuna at one point. And he goes... He's, uh, you know, he's trying to bulk up. He's uh, 260, perhaps 270 pounds. Actually, 460, perhaps 40. He was off by 200 pounds the first time he, he talked about Yokozuna's weight. And then later he added another 100 pounds, which uh, he was not over 500 pounds at this point. But he was not pretty, he was, he was a big dude. Oh, yeah. He was the heavyweight. Now, it worked out because the fight was structured. Lex was fighting like a like a cruiserweight in this match. He was floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. He was dodging everything and countering everything and counterpunching and hitting a bunch of jabs. And every once in a while, Yoko, the heavyweight, would hit a big haymaker. And it wasn't always a punch. It'd be a urinagi, a super kick, or whatever. But it, it, like it, the, the the if you had a what do you call it, the compu box numbers for this in total strikes, Lex Luger would have been way ahead. But in significant strikes, Yokozuna had the edge. So they had a. Uh, and it, it, a good match. It was basically a good 10-minute match stretched over 18 minutes. The, the middle part of this went long, and it wasn't just because Yokozuna had yet to pace things for Yoko to make him work a certain way. It just went longer than it needed to. The other smart thing they did was everything that, un, that, that had been the undoing of Hulk Hogan and the title loss to Yokozuna, Lex Luger countered. And Yoko tries that leg drop the first time, and Lex dodges. And Yoko hits it later for a near fall, and Lex kicks out. And Fuji tries to interfere with a bucket, but Lex sees him coming. He knocks the salt out of his hand. So he's, he's, he's learned from uh, everything, all the mistakes Hulk made and everything that uh, undid Hulk in their title match. So goes, it does go on for a long time. And finally, uh, uh, Yokozuna misses a bonsai drop. Lex makes his comeback. Yoko misses a running ass lance in the corner. Lex hits this body slam on the third or fourth try, and the place just goes absolutely nuts. And Lex goes to the middle rope, and he's got that big stars and stripes. Up. I forgot how gaudy Lex Luger's All-American gear was. Just red, white, blue, gold, and spangles everywhere. But he hits a diving middle rope elbow shot, and Lyoko goes tumbling backwards and out of the ring. And he is counted out! You know, I uh, before we get to the finish, I want to put over what a fantastic worker i think yokozuna is and he would get tired there at the end but in general he was a good worker and he knew what to do he knew when to do it his offense looked good his selling looked good 
I mean, how many of these, uh, someone here in the chat's noting, like, Omas and Gonzalez both try to do the, oh, I'm going to take a big bump, and it looks like shit, but man, Yokozuna knew how to do it. Oh, yeah. And I was so impressed with him in this match, and Luger, you know, Luger was mostly just selling and everything like that, but every time he'd make a comeback, this fucking crowd would go crazy. And every time he would hit a big move, they would go. They were so behind this guy. And as you noted, they worked a smart match. I don't think it went too long, maybe a little bit, but it's only 18 minutes. It's the main event of SummerSlam. I mean, they've been building this thing up forever, so got to put in some time. But I thought it was very clever, as stupid as the ending was. What I did think was clever that none of the announcers even mentioned is, first off, Luger cheated. Because the rule was he had to cover up his uh, his bionic forearm. So after he hits that body slam, which, speaking of apoplectic, Bobby Heenan loses his mind, screaming hip toss. Hip toss. Hip toss. So uh, the referee is uh, watching Fuji or something like that. And Luger pulls down the pad, and he illegally uses the metal forearm gimmick. What a cheat. And, and Yokozuna tumbles outside. And what I thought was, what they actually did was clever, but the answer didn't catch it. The ref starts counting. And as everybody's aware, you cannot win the title on a countout or disqualification. But as the ref gets to four and five, because Luger's busy putting his, his elbow pad back on. So that's the first five seconds. He's trying to cover up his, his uh, forearm, his bionic forearm. So at five, he could go get the guy to throw him into the ring. But at that moment, Jim Cornette jumps up on the apron. So Luger is distracted. He has to go over and punch him. That's seven, eight, nine. And then by the time Luger turns around, the referee has counted ten. And Yokozuna is counted out. Now, granted, one of the problems with this count out, besides the fact that it sucked, is Luger celebrated like he won the title. Oh, even yeah. Even though everybody knew he hadn't won the title. And so he came off looking like a fucking geek. Like he didn't know the rules. He he failed in winning the title. Like he won the match. He got his hand raised. But it was a fucking count out. The, the, evil, the evil foreigner that they've built up on television. He's still the champion. This was Luger's one chance. He came off as a geek and a loser. And I knew the finish. We've been talking about the finish for weeks on this show. But when I watched it, I was like... Who in the absolute fuck thought that this was a good idea? I like, know. I know the idea was, well, you know, we're going to go with Luger, but why don't we hold it off and do the big crowning achievement at WrestleMania? Yeah. And that was the idea. And listen, there's a million ideas, but watching this match, it's like somebody should have called an audible. Somebody should have said, put that belt on him tonight. Because... It's not like we talk about theory not being ready and everything. It was time. The fans were ready for Luger to be the champion. They'd done the bus. I know you don't like the bus or whatever, but it made him come off as a big deal and a big star and a big hero. And they were into him and they were into the match. And then he's a geek. And I was, it was even more mind-blowing watching it today than it probably was watching it then. So he that, failed. Since, since we now know he never did, in fact, capitalize. He never was WWF champion. And you know what's funny? You know what's funny? And I think they probably just wanted to save the pinfall, and that's why they didn't do it. But if he would have pulled that elbow pad down, hit that forearm, then hit the big body slam, pin the guy in the middle of the ring, been handed the title... And as he's celebrating, and you don't even have to do it on this show. You could have done the dusty finish on on the next Raw or whatever. But have Jack Tunney say, the rules were that you had to wear an elbow pad, and you pulled it down, and you illegally used your forearm. Therefore, I have no choice but to reverse the decision and give the title back to Yokozuna. At least then he would have achieved his goal. He would have come off as a guy that got screwed. He would have to work his way back. I'm not saying it would have worked. It may have been the same thing that happened with Brett, but that would have been better than the count out. That was a fucking horrible finish. And the real finish should have been him winning that title, becoming the WWF champion. I don't know how much history had changed if that would have happened, but it might have changed substantially. 
Maybe it wouldn't have changed much at all. Maybe people would have got sick of him and wanted to see Brett or whatever. But he should have, he absolutely, 100%, one way or the other, should have got the pin and won this match. So the Steiners are carrying him around. Tatanka's out there, and the balloons are flying, and Vince is screaming about a rematch. And uh, that's how SummerSlam ends. So there you go. Um, on the whole, this was, there was it was good, fine. Yeah, it was a thumbs in the middle show. There was some good stuff. There was some bad stuff. I have seen worse pay-per-views, but so they can't recommend going out of your way to watch it. Sky here has an even better idea. Like, what? What? What if? What if the referee was distracted by Fuji and Jim Cornette jumped up on the apron with the racket and Luger went for Cornette and they had a tug of war over the racket and in the tug of war, Luger's pad got pulled down. So he didn't even do it. It got pulled down by the heel. And then he uses the bionic forearm, hit the big fucking slam, everybody goes crazy, he gets the pin. And then, when Tunney reversed the decision, not only did he get screwed, but it wasn't even his own fault. There's so many ideas. Better than So you, many no ideas. Doubt. And this was a fucking disaster. Yeah, the thing here is we watched this on Peacock, basically for free. So I think that's why watching it, it was like a fine show. But I think that if you'd been excited for this match and you wanted to see Luger become the champion and you paid 35 bucks for the pay-per-view in, you know, $19.93 or whatever, I think you'd be pretty fucking pissed when the show was over. That's probably That would true. be my guess. Yeah. 